bless your name today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. All of our fathers, you just stay standing and everyone else just sit down. Give them a hand as you do. We are thankful for you dads, all of you dads. Just stay up just for a minute. Now, we've got a men's conference this weekend coming up. We start fasting. Now, you what, fast something all throughout the week. Just put something to the side and say, God, I want more of you. But this Friday, this Saturday, uh, we start our men's conference. It's going to be good. And after the message today, you're going to hear this. There's a demonic assault on men and on fathers. And I'm not excluding the ladies because the devil's bad and he's after us all. But, men, we've got to stand strong. Amen. And we're thankful for you. So you may be seated. We, we are so thankful for you, men. Let me just say a few things. This is a very busy week. We've got VBS starting tomorrow. And if you haven't got your children registered, get those in there because, hey, we, we can be trusted with your kids. There's some people that can't be, but we can. Amen. There's some department stores that can't be. There's some educational systems that can't be. But we can be trusted with your kids. So uh, we've got a big week and then the men at the end of the week. And I just want to give a shout out. You know, the 18 for 18, some of you guys got this card last week. If you missed last week, we, we kicked off giving for our new building that we're going to start. We're going to start on real soon. I mean, really, we're going to start real soon. But there's a pledge card. I think we, we got over 160000 in pledges last week for that so thank you for that and we're, we're on our way I would love you know we got a loan but I would love to pay that loan off before we have to wouldn't you love to see that happen and so uh, Chris Enright thank you that we had we people not only gave money they volunteered services he's going to plumb our new building I believe that's going to work out so man that's awesome isn't it um, and and so many things like that Desiree I heard you down here you're I didn't see you, but I heard you, your war cry. Lift your hand up. She ran track at North Carolina. She was a Tar Heel. Where are you at? Where's she at? She disappeared? I can't see her. She just leaves when we start preaching. She's here for the worship. We got a gift for you men on your way out today. You'll be getting something on your way out. That's just for the fathers. So we've got something for you. But uh, she posted something. I was going to embarrass her. She posted, I, I'm really proud of what people do. She's a single mom. She posted she had started her 18 for 18. And uh, in the same week, God advanced her. That was a year from now, she's supposed to get a raise that would be, you know, double that. She got the raise this week. When she started that, the raise already came. That's the way God's work. I'm telling you, it, it's a different economy. It doesn't make sense, but it makes sense. And God does it. God does it. I've always said if it's God's will, it's God's bill. Um, I think it was Monday afternoon. I got a, a text from Pastor Joe Schutz, New Freedom Church. I want to give you guys a shout out. New Freedom Church, um, because he had, he had a, an envelope, took a picture of it, and he was sending his 18 for 18. Their church, they just paid in full. It was like $1,400, $1,500 they just sent us just like that from their church. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. And, I, and I'm just telling you, me, the way it goes with me, I don't forget things like that. I don't, I don't forget when people, are, when people come in in times of need. I don't forget that. Do you forget things like that? Amen. There's a, script, there's a passage, a whole chapter, Deuteronomy 8, where God said, if you forget what I've done, I don't forget things like that. So I'm so thankful for what God is doing. Amen. God is good. God is good. And I know I'm supposed to announce something else, but hey, it's Father's Day. I'm not good at announcing things. So anyway, I want you to turn to Mark chapter 9. This message could be taken a little controversial because it's controversial. And uh, no other reason than that. But I want to talk about dads and demons today. So Father, I ask you to bless this word. Speak to us. We ask you, Lord God, to give us divine direction in a world of chaos, 
in a world of confusion. It affects every one of us. Every household is affected, affected by this confusion and by what the demonic has been unleashed upon our nation. I ask you just to help us navigate this and help us, Lord God, to do what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I think it was 1945, 46, somewhere in there. In Germany, Nazi Germany, these stats are close to being spot on. If they're not spot on, they're very close. And there was somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 1,800 pastors and churches. 18,000, I'm sorry, 18,000. And 3,000 of them immediately protest Nazi Germany, Adolf Hitler. They immediately protest. They understood this is wrong and what you're trying to do. And this is before it really vamped up in, into just all-out assault on the Jewish people. But there was around 3,000 churches that said, no, we're not doing that. They, they stood up, stood out, and many of them suffered. They went to concentration camps themselves. There were 3,000, estimated around 3,000 churches that just went with it and said, uh, you know, we're just, it's part of the system, separation, church, and state, and they just went with it. But then there was about 12,000, about 12,000 churches that just said, we're just, we're just going to sit this one out. And I want to just say that that's one of the worst things that a church can do, is just to say, we're just going to sit this one out. In saying that, that's also one of the worst things a father can do. That's one of the worst things a dad can do. That's one of the worst things a man can do is to just sit this one out. It'd be much easier to just comply and to just follow along with everything that's going on. C.S. Lewis said, if, if the whole world is running towards a cliff and there's somebody going the opposite direction, everyone considers them as lost their mind. But I want to tell you, I'm a pastor, and I believe this is a church that has lost its mind because I'm not going to go the way of the world. I'm not going to go. You know, churches are panicking. They're afraid. They want to keep tax, nonprofit, tax-exempt status. I don't give, pardon me, it's meant, I don't give a crap. I don't give. I hope we don't have to pay taxes. I mean, nobody wants to pay taxes, right? But I would rather pay taxes than pay with my soul at the end of days and not speak the truth that God has for us. So I want to show you an example in Mark chapter 9. It's in three of the Gospels. In Mark chapter 9. And this one's just a little more thorough, so it would be a little more reading. But I want you to see this, and I want to use this allegory. The Bible said there was one in a crowd that said, speaking out to Jesus, Mark 9, verse 17, Teacher, I brought you my son who, was a, who has a mute spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He throws the disciples under the bus, by the way. They couldn't do it. He answered him again and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. So he, he begins to manifest immediately. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has, he, has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown himself both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. So he's trying to kill himself. He throws himself in fire, throws himself in water. By the way, those are extremities. Fire, water. Water to fire. Extremities. We're living in a generation of extremities. And so he throws himself. He's suicidal. And then he says these words, but if. Let's mark that if. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus, 
Jesus hands the if back. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, he identifies it, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. When he had come into the house, His disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? He then said to them, this this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. This week we're going to enter a a, a season of fasting and prayer. And those go together, tandem. It's not just, I'm not going to eat. It's prayer and fasting. Think of it like this, prayer connects you to God. Prayer connects you to God. Fasting disconnects you from the world. Disconnects you from the world. And so I I heard Miss Sharon's voice out there. Miss Sharon, you know, I'm not going to embarrass you. You just did something so beautiful last week. uh, Told me a story. And Juneteenth is tomorrow, so that's a time where we should celebrate. And it's it's. It's strange because you celebrate, but we celebrate freedom. We don't celebrate the travesties of the past and and the sin of the past. You do know that sin, right? I mean, because I know I I preach to a predominantly white congregation here, but not out there. In fact, this week we, uh, a lot of things, I just keep thinking about a lot of things that happened this week. Uh, I failed to announce last week, because I'm bad at announcements, that we were going to do an outdoor baptism. And uh, I just put it on Facebook, and we had dozens of people show up. I didn't know of one person that was going to show up, but dozens showed up. And Satan is evil. He's cruel. He comes against our homes, our houses. He comes against our mindsets. You know... I know I'm flooding you with a lot of things right now. I'm just trying to get myself in order, okay? First of all, Miss Sharon, she told me about her grandfather. I think it was her grandfather or great-grandfather that would babysit her as a child and would sing the old gospel songs. And he was either a son of a slave or a slave himself and, and would sing that and say, this is how we got by. It's by our faith and by our worship. Amen? And so uh, this week when we were out at the river, I went to the river on Tuesday and made a video, I think it was on Tuesday, and, and we showed back up on Wednesday, and all I did was walk to the river. All I did is, and I'm not, I'm not weak, you know, I don't like to think of myself as weak, but I just walked to the river, made a video, as I'm walking back to my truck, my back went out so bad that I thought I'm going to have to crawl to my truck. And it was just like, that's demonic. I wasn't lifting. I wasn't pulling. I wasn't doing anything. I mean, I was walking back. And if you saw any of those little clips from the river, uh, we've had a household revival. And a lot of you in this church, there's been a household revival for a lot of you. Amen? But I can, I can honestly say my whole house is full of the Holy Ghost right now. We've had a household revival. And so I said to Treg, my son-in-law, and Nathan, my son, my sons, I said, you're going to help me. And they're like, what? I said, you're going to help me baptize. They've never baptized. So if you got baptized and didn't get all the way wet, it's because they were amateurs. But (laughs) there was one in particular. I thought, we need to do this one over. You guys did. Y'all just. But. But what happened was the next day, when I could still hardly walk, I I prayed all day about it. I went down. I said, you boys are going to help me because you're my sons, and you're going to baptize people. And you'll see me kind of like standing like Benny Hinn, you know, when people falling down and coming back. It's because I couldn't lean forward 
But I was not going to let the devil beat me. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's what everybody in this room, listen, whenever the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against it. We are under attack. We're under attack. And there's people that want to just sign off and say, hey, there's nothing to that. We don't want to talk about demons. As to, you know, what, that's such a downer. Why don't you tell us something about prosperity? Why don't you tell us, don't talk about demons. Well, let me, I want to give you three numbers this morning. Three, four, seven. Three, four, seven. What's that? That was three boys in Claremont County three days ago. Three or seven the father put them in a room and execution style killed them you can see the story you can watch it on the news you can see you can see the body cam footage you can see the the father crying weeping like a baby now he doesn't quite know why he snapped or how he snapped but I do there are demonic forces loose in this earth. And when we're playing little games like we sing songs in red jumpsuits and act like the devil and, and playing with the cross and turning things up and, and going to the Dodgers and these, these nuns, these men, men make ugly women, by the way. These men, they want to just rain down and, and then you get invited, uninvited, invited back. There's so much bullying and pushing, and there's such an aggressive. It, it's, it's so funny that the church is painted as mean when the church is kind. The church is painted as intolerant when the church is the most tolerant. God loves you. Hey, by the way, and I'll just say this online because, by the way, every one of us will believe the same thing. In about 100 years, there's not one of us that will deviate from the truth. Every one of us will believe the same thing. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Every one of us will believe the same thing. But we won't have the same outcome. And so what we are doing right now is trying to get everybody into the belief system before it's too late. Because every knee will bow by faith or by force but every knee will bow. We'll believe the same thing. We'll believe the same thing. We'll believe the same thing. And we'll believe it according to God's word. In this story, we see a man who has a son who is demon-possessed. Now, he takes him to the disciples, and he said they didn't, they didn't know what to do. And they circle back with Jesus and say, how did you do that? We didn't know how to do that. But they kind of missed it here too because you can see, I don't know if pride or arrogance or, or, or maybe they're just disappointed in themselves. I don't know what got involved here, but something got involved that they never made the connection. This is a story that you don't see. This is the story behind the story. They never brought the man to Jesus. The man showed up. He's just like a heckler in a crowd. Hey, Jesus. He showed up on his own. Maybe they were thinking, I wish he'd be quiet. Because you, it's hard to believe this, but believe it or not, in the Christian realm, pride and arrogance still operates. And who gets the miracle? Or who gets, who gets blessed for the miracle? Or who has this ministry? Or who does that? And they don't even bring him to Jesus. They can't do it, so they give up on it. Maybe think he'll just go away. There's a lot of things in this world that are happening today that many people are just probably thinking, I wish it would just go away. In fact, <coughs> Pastor Brian, who was our, our youth pastor, now pastors a great church in Beaver Creek. Uh, pastor Brian, our sister church, uh, today church is what it's called in Beaver Creek. If you're in that direction, go there. But he was going through a list with me of young people he actually really just he robbed, he robbed me of such joy the other day we were going out we were going to we were going into the woods really we were in a side by side we were talking we were going into the woods to hunt bear in Canada 
And he starts listing off names of young people that came through our youth group that are now living a homosexual lifestyle. And he just tells me all of those. And of course it's concern. But the whole time I'm in the woods, I'm just praying and thinking about those kids that grew up in this church. They grew up in this church. And a lot of them are vent their anger towards him. He was their youth pastor. And there's something about it where you understand that it's a demonic spirit when that it's always angry. It's always mad. It always wants to pick a fight. It always, it's so aggressive. And I know some of y'all right now are sitting back like, Pastor Matt, I wish you wouldn't go here. Listen, you don't have to go there. It comes here. It comes to you. It comes to you. The Bible said in Ephesians 6 and 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Verse 12, he says, we wrestle not. That's what a lot of you want to do, wrestle not. But he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. In other words, they've got a place. They've got a platform. They feel strong. They, they come. Why do they attack the church the way they attack the church? You say, well, the church is attacking them. Man, I want every soul to be saved. I want every life to be changed. I want every, every heart, every person to be transformed. The Bible said, Jesus said, God is not, God does not, the Bible said he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God's not even happy. Happy, you know, when we're cheering and giving high fives of Saddam Hussein, you know, or, or, or somebody, Osama bin Laden has been taken out. Not God. Not God. He said he takes no pleasure, no pleasure in the death of any soul that he created. Why do you think he hates you? Or why, why do you go after the church? Why do you go after Jesus the way you do? Why is this, this anger, this hostility so pent up on the inside of you? And I know a lot of people just don't want to step into that and don't want to, don't want to feel the brunt of that. I don't either. I really want peace. But I'll tell you, it's in, we're living in a world. Fathers, just listen to me. You can just say, this is my father talk. We're living in a world where you have to stand up. If you don't stand up, darkness will invade everything you have. It will steal. It will rob. It will invade everything. My wife yesterday screams from the front yard. She's like, Matt, come out here. Snake, snake. She's so afraid of snakes. So I, I go outside and um, there's a snake. And I, I just grab the snake by the tail. and It's not poisonous. I'm holding it. And as I'm holding the snake, you know, give him a little wiggle so he doesn't work his way back up. I'm holding this snake. And I look to my left and I said, Wow. There's another one right there, right in the, in the bush right there. So I, I grab another one with my other hand. I've never done that. I got bit for the first time in my life. I got bit by a snake. I was so distracted, you know, trying to. I got bit. And I told, I told my wife, I'm like, I'm 57 years old. I have never bit. I played with snakes when I was a little boy. My dad would say, a snake is still a snake, Matt. I would have one in a two-liter bottle. Say, it's my pet. No, a snake is a snake. Get rid of it. I've never been bit. Now, the little boy inside of me always wondered what it felt like to get bit, so I know now. <laughs> I got that check. Bucket list. Bit by a snake. It didn't hurt worse than your vaccine. But, uh... <laughs> Father, forgive him. He knows not what he does. We're in a world today, though, where you can get distracted very easy. You can get caught off guard. You can, th you can think, well, I've done this so long. This, I can do this. You can get so distracted. You can get so turned around. I was reading this about sharks. I, I just always think sharks are fascinating. And I, yeah, I am afraid of sharks, but I just think they're fascinating. And, and they were showing how that dolphins and other creatures, if they can flip a shark, 
if they can just flip it over, upside down. A shark can't do anything once you flip him over. It's kind of like a turtle. Can't do anything. They call it tonic immobility. Tonic immobility. So what they think it is, is sensory overload. Because it has so many senses that once it's flipped over, it's sensory overload. And then other fish will eat it while it's still alive. They'll just eat it. Because all it can do is shake. I want to just say this. I believe that the modern church in America is dealing with sensory overload. You've been flipped upside down, and now you just don't know what to do. I don't want to offend you. I don't want to hurt you. I, and, and instead of offending people, you'll offend God and not preach his gospel and not preach his truth. I'm telling you, we're living in a world where things are so bizarre. They are so twisted. And God said this would happen. Light would look like darkness. Darkness would be preferred over light. Good would be bad, and bad would be good. It's so flipped. The stage has so flipped, so flipped, that it's time for us to stand up. You must stand up. Let me give you some passages real fast. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, it says, Be on guard. Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. I love this passage. The ESV says it like this. Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. If you see a man near you, just look at him and say, act like a man. Act like like men. If you don't act like a man, a woman will. She treats me like she's my mom. Quit being her child. Act like men. I'm getting more more feedback from women than men. What's going on here? (laughs) Act like men. I love there's a passage in Joel. Joel 3, verse 9, it says, Proclaim among the nations, prepare for war. I guess that's basically what I'm saying today. Prepare for war. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. What does that mean? That means there's mighty men that have been sleeping. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war come near. Then God says, let them arise. Let them come up. It's time to come up. It's time to come up to our place. Our job is to be 3D watchmen. Just look at somebody say 3D, 3D, 3D. We are to detect, to defend, and to deliver. That is our job. Greg, will you come on up here if you're here? Did you make it up here? Come on up here. This, is, this shirt is appropriate for, for the moment. 3D, detect, defend, deliver. We were having a little fun with it this week, but talking about my daughters when they were young. And I was, you know, when I'm a 27-year-old dad, I don't know how to say all the things I want to say. So I just, you know, I might get in a lot of trouble, especially at home for this one. But we had a name for my, my oldest daughter. We had a name for her vagina. We had a name, and this isn't funny, this is actually serious, because I didn't know where she would be when I wouldn't be there, or her mother wouldn't be there, and so we had a a funny little name for this particular part of her body, and we would say, and nobody see, I know you want to know it, don't you, because it won't, it's cuckoo, okay? And it's funny because if anybody said anything and that word ever came up, she would look at them and look at me and, you know, Dad, are they in trouble? And she, she would come back, little, three, four-year-old. Did anybody touch your cuckoo? 
Are y'all as nervous as me? Did anybody did anybody touch you there? Did anybody did someone take you to the restroom? Did anybody do? I mean, I was like overprotective dad. And I'm just gonna say, dads and moms, you better be over overprotective today. And you better have a language where your child can warn you when something is going on. None of this, when I'm 18, tell you what happened when I was four. Are y'all, y'all hearing me? This is dad talk. This is dad talk. And so there, there was always this, this interaction of, of what is happening. But I want you to know that today in, in this world, men, not only do you have a target on your back, but there's a target on your children. There's a target on your spouse. There's a target on everything you do. There's a target on this church. Don't think for one day you don't have anything to pray about. Pray about us. Pray about me. There's a target here. There, there, the enemy has set his sight to attack you. There's a target right here. Why in the world... Why in the world, when now a father to a daughter to a son, that kind of conversation makes sense. But, but when a whole generation of people, or even our president, when they say at age four they ought to be able to pick out their sexuality, anybody that's talking to a child about sexuality is a pervert. It's a pervert. Anybody that wants to to drag dance in front of a child. Why do you want to go to a library to hold children on your lap? You're a pervert. You're a pervert. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. So it's our job to not only to see this, to define this, but also to deliver a generation that is lost and confused. You know, and, and I get the stuff, you know, like homophobe stuff, and I Man, I'm not the greatest with the English language, but I always thought the word phobia meant fear of. And I, I'm not afraid of homosexuals. I love homosexuals. I'm not afraid. I'm not, I'm not afraid. What I'm afraid of is not obeying what God has told me to obey and not preaching what God has said preach. And that's called His Word. And at the last days, according to John, the Bible said that we will be judged by His Word word. I'm going to bring this to a close, okay? I know it's a little controversial, little little deep, but this is the obvious thing. This is the obvious thing about this dad that brings his son, brings his son that's demon-possessed to Jesus. The disciples didn't bring him. That, that actually represents the church, that we're supposed to be the ones that connect people to Jesus. And if we're busy just trying to connect people to our church, what a great church, what a great organization. If we're so busy just branding and marketing ourselves, we miss the whole point entirely. We miss it all. We miss it all. So the disciples really didn't do their job. They didn't bring the man to Jesus. But I want you to look at the man because this is what I think the man looked like. Because the disciples didn't save that boy from the water. They weren't the lifeguards. The, the, the disciples weren't the firemen. They weren't the first responders. The only reason that demon-possessed boy was still alive was this guy who had gone into the water to save that child, who had gone into the fire. Now, some of the things I'm talking to you today about are actually prepping you to go into the fire. You say, well, I don't want to talk to my daughter. Or I don't want to talk to my nephew. I don't want to talk to... I'm prepping you to go into the fire. Because this is the guy who is hated. This is the guy who's ignored. This is the guy, even the disciples ignored him. He said, they didn't help me. But this is the guy who would be called a good father. And I believe that God is raising up good fathers in the last days that will face demons 
It's bigger than you. It's bigger than a sexual persuasion. It's bigger than what society says. It is demonic. And God's going to call forth some men. Now, now here's the deal. If you're dealing with your own problems, and we all have issues, but if you're dealing with your own issues, that's one of the reasons Satan uses that failure in your life to leverage you to mute your mouth. Didn't he call it a mute spirit? To mute your mouth where you don't speak up. Because we've always felt like if you speak up, you have to be a person that's above reproach. I'm just going to tell you, that's not true. All of us fail. All of us come short. Don't be surprised. We've all got failures. But if you want people to live in failure, if you want your sons and daughters to live in your failure, just because you're afraid of the admission of like, I failed too, but I'm going to drag us out of this hole. I'm going to drag us out of this water. I'm going to drag us out of this fire. I'm going to be a dad that at the end of the day, you're going to understand you had a father that loved you. And I want this church to be like that. I want us to be a church that's, that's basically on a battlefield, basically on a front line. I dealt with something just a week ago that was, it would blow your mind. But I said to someone, other pastor, we were with other pastors, and I said, we're a front line church. We're a front line church. We deal with issues. And sometimes... It might not look like we do because we have the love of the Lord in us and the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, but we still deal with it. We still go through it. Will you just stand to your feet with me right now? Thank you, Greg. Just stand up. I know this is a strange Father's Day message, but I just figured I could say what I wanted to. If I let you out early, the dads would be okay with it. It hasn't even been an hour. Think about your home and your family. Think about your residence. Then think about your neighborhood. Think about your school. Think about your city, your government, your state, your nation. And then think about the world. God so loved the world that he gave his own only begotten son. If we go all the way back to Adam, you'll find out that there was a failure. And after the failure, there was a death. Something had to die. And the Bible said God covered them with skins, probably lambs that would represent, that would be symbolic. You know, there was peace and harmony in the garden. Lion and lamb lay down beside each other until God slew something to create this skin, this covering for Adam and Eve so that the first sacrifice would represent the last sacrifice. That would be Jesus Christ. Then you move on from Genesis and you get into Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, the double law, and you start seeing all of this where they would bring a lamb yearly. And this, this lamb would be for the whole nation of Israel. It's called the Day of Atonement. So there was a lamb for a man, Adam. Then there was a lamb for a nation. But then in John, the Bible said that John the Baptist was baptizing. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes over the hill. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world. So that there was a Lamb for a man. There was a Lamb for a nation. There was a Lamb for the world, for the whole world. Jesus Christ died so that we could be set free. Jesus Christ died so that we could have life and that more abundantly. Not just life, but abundant life. Some of the fights that I'm talking about, some of the things that you have to go into, you're having to face because they're coming your way, whether you want to or not. You can't just be a peaceable person. You can't just sit this out. It's coming your way. Some of this is not only for you, not only for you to be a child of God, 
to do what you're called to do, but it's actually for them. Because that unsettling spirit, that demonic spirit, does not stop in somebody's life. Sure, you guys can get married. You ladies can get married. Sure, all, let, let all this keep happening. But there's more. Never satisfied. Why do you think that is? Check out the statistics. Google it today. Check out suicide. Who, who, who does it most? Who does it most? Check out things like that and you'll find out that the devil's not through with you. He's not through with you. He's not through with just getting your daughter, your son, your spouse. He's not through until he gets the whole world. But there's also a Savior. There's a Savior. His name is Jesus. And I don't want to, in this example, I don't want to be like the disciples. I want to be like the church of Jesus Christ that grabs people and brings them to Jesus. I know there's a fine line between speaking the truth and speaking the truth in love. Truth is what we say. Love is how we say it. I promise you, I don't say this vindictive. I don't say this mean or angry. But I am so hurt when I think about souls that could be lost for eternity. Even ones that have grown up in this church. Lost for eternity. That hurts my soul. That hurts my soul. And so I want to pray over you right now. I want to pray over you online. Listen, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, it was so beautiful this week at the river just to watch people. So many of them I didn't even know just come out to be baptized. You know what that tells me? That tells me that there is a voice that God is still speaking, that God is still calling people. And He's calling people to repentance. He's calling people to change. And I want to be a church of change, don't you? Don't you want to be a church of change? And so the Bible said, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And maybe all of us this morning, we should just make a confession before the Lord. Lord, forgive us. Lord, forgive us. Lord, forgive us for sins of commission, things that we have done that are contrary to your word. But also forgive us for sins of omission. Those are things we didn't even know we were doing. Maybe we didn't stand when we were supposed to stand. Maybe we didn't speak up when we were supposed to speak up. Maybe we didn't go. Maybe we ran from the fire or we ran from the river. We ran from the water. And others were in trouble and they were hanging on for dear life. I ask you, Lord God, just to help us to be a church that's different. We're just different because that's what you've required in the last days of people that know their God and will do great exploits. I ask you to help us, Lord God, in everything we put our hands to. According to Psalms 1, you said everything we put our hands to shall prosper. Help us, Lord God, to prosper. Help us, Lord, to see souls saved. Now, everybody in this room, everybody online, you know somebody that's been tormented, that's been affected by this. Somebody, they may come at you mean or adversarial, lashing out, but I just pray in the name of Jesus that you open doors, Lord, that no man can shut. You shut doors that no man can open. I pray, Lord God, that you make ways where there is no way. I pray the Apostle Paul said that you would give us a door of utterance. That means we would be able to speak to somebody in need. Be able to speak to somebody who's hurting. Be able to help them. I pray that this church be a last days church, an end time church, a church that understands the day and understands what to do. You've called us to do something for you. It's not brave. It's not brave to lift a flag that it represents a, a, a wrong lifestyle. That's not brave. What is brave is to speak the truth in the midst of adversity. What is brave is to oppose the tide and say, God, I'm going to follow you no matter what. But I'm not going to just let this go without speaking, without reaching, 
without, with every essence, every part of me, without trying my best to win souls to your kingdom. I ask you to help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.